this has already been such a wonderful um, uh, experience. I'm really grateful to um, uh, Amit and uh, Richard, not just for um, putting this together, but also just for the, the uh, wonderful structure. And uh, um, what, what we're doing in, in this panel is in some sense a natural flow to uh, the ideas here. So let me use a metaphor. Um, so what Vivek and uh, Christian have done is, is uh, you know, they're the landscape architects. They've shown you, you know, what a, what a beautiful garden will, India will be, uh, you know, decades down the road. And now we're going to kind of walk through and see, you know, stoop down, see where the weeds are growing and need to be uprooted, where there's some more irrigation needed, a little more fertilizer needed. And, and uh, uh, that, that's, that's the thing about India. It is, as, as Vivek said, it's large, it's heterogeneous, and one really has to get down to that level to understand. So, um, uh, so this, this is verbatim what, what um, uh, Amit uh, asked us to talk about in this panel. Uh, regional differences, states, uh, cities, and uh, in a, the innovation e ecosystem. And so I'll start with economic and social development. And I'm just going to show you a lot of, a lot of pictures. And actually, a lot of those pictures are the map of India. And for those of you, of course, who grew up in India, uh, you all know the map of India, but many of you may not be familiar with it. So this is, this is uh, net state domestic product per capita. And just to give you a sense of the heterogeneity, this is, of course, the basic measure. You can see that uh, there's a, a difference, big difference between the West and South and the rest of India. Of course, there's a northern region there around Delhi and Haryana and uh, surprisingly Uttarakhand. Uh, and there's just a few of the states there. And uh, you'll recognize some of the, you know, the, the usual states in the usual positions, Bihar at the bottom, you know, uh, out of the, the major states, Karnataka and Haryana near the top. Um, and the only, th the only thing that I want to uh, point out to you is the position of Punjab, which is just about above the average for India. And some of you may be surprised because, you know, you may have grown up with this notion that Punjab is a prosperous state. And the reason I want to point this out is because what I want to say to you is that policy matters and one has to look at the state level and uh, the fact that Punjab has uh, gone down so rapidly in the state rankings tells us that uh, policy matters. And so both upward and downward movements are possible. So no nothing, is, nothing is preordained. Uh, change can be rapid, both uh, positively and negatively. Uh, sorry. OK, so here's uh, another map. And uh, I, I chose this from the Economic Survey of India. And fortuitously, it's something that Vivek mentioned. This is the uh, uh, progress in terms of tap water connections. And you can see in quite rapid progress, which uh, is good. And you can also see the same pattern of, as, as with uh, uh, per capita income, which, which is what one would expect that uh, you know, specifics of uh, social development map uh, very closely with uh, per capita income, with, with overall prosperity. But that's not always the case. Here is out-of-pocket percentage of health expenditure. And you can see that uh, in, in one of the poorest states, uh, Uttar Pradesh, it has the highest percentage of people having to pay out of pocket for health expenditure. So what I want to say is that this is where India's federal system starts to show up and where governance at the state level starts to matter. So I'm, again, I'm just uh, kind of setting the stage for uh, looking at some of these things in more detail. We'll be doing that over the next, next two days. Uh, if one goes down to the district level, and in many cases, that's really where, where uh, one has to start paying attention. Christian showed you one map. Uh, this is the uh, map of aspirational districts. This is not the official map. I couldn't find one uh, on Niti Aayog, but uh, I think it's close enough. And again, you can see that a lot of the aspirational districts are similarly placed to the per capita income, but not always. And this, this is also very educational. If you look at this, there's one district uh, in Haryana, and uh, it, it has some issues there in terms of governance and social indicators and so on. So again, I think uh, really one has to kind of walk through the garden very carefully. The uh, aspirational district's uh, uh, selection is actually quite complicated. It's very interesting, and I'd, I'd refer you to that. Amit knows much more about it. He's been responsible for it. 
But what, I, what this made me do was actually go back to what I think is the seminal work on, on looking at India at the district level, which is by Bebek and uh, Lavish Bhandari, uh, District Level Deprivation in the New Millennium. This is actually a, a, a book. And 20 years later, it's still worth going through that and seeing how they systematically looked at every district in India. Of course, the boundaries have changed and so on. Again, you can see a similar kind of uh, distribution of you know, East and South and Uttar Pradesh and uh, Bihar, Jharkhand, Odisha, and so on. So, uh, but it's, it's not everywhere in, every sta in, in those states too, right? So one has to identify the, uh, the areas that need attention. Uh, it's also important to recognize, and I think this has come up, that we're, we're not necessarily going to uh, make India a prosperous nation by uh, just focusing on the most backward districts. The idea is not to, to you know, make, make those uh, districts on a par with uh, a New Delhi or a Bengaluru and so on, but you still have to uh, uh, kind of raise people up to a, a, a basic level. And you have to be, enable them to, and Christian made this point, you have to enable them to participate and so one, one uh, very clear uh, message that comes out of the data and analysis is that things like rural roads matter a lot. You know, connectivity in that sense matters a lot. So looking at economic activity and infrastructure going to what actually generates jobs, what generates uh, uh, wealth, uh, it's business, right? Uh, and here's uh, uh, a graph from uh, a paper by three economists. Uh, Ajaz Ghani, William Kerr, and Stephen O'Connell of uh, business registration density. And their point is that, well, South Asia is, is kind of low, but maybe that's not by itself an issue because you can see that uh, Korea and Japan also are below the, below the line. So let's look a little more uh, at this, uh, this point about businesses. Again, you can see that this is from the Economic Survey of India again. Uh, you can see that where are, where are the factory workers in India? in Tamil Nadu, Gujarat, Maharashtra. Uttar Pradesh is, is next, but of course Uttar Pradesh is 200 million people. Uttar Pradesh is the size of Brazil in population. So when we, when we correct for that, then of course it wouldn't be so, uh, so uh, significant. Again, my point is that this is very highly correlated with economic activity, uh, with, the, with state domestic product. And uh, an interesting, uh, again, uh, I think outlier is Uttarakhand. And, my point is that looking at the subnational level and thinking about, well, why, is the state, why does the state have these characteristics is very important to understand how to uh, uh, implement policies. So Christian was mostly looking at the national level, but then the natural corollary is to go down to the state level. Uh, teledensity, again, you can see some of these patterns, but uh, it's, again, not necessarily correlated uh, that well with the per capita income. My, uh, uh, lesson from that is that uh, these kind of things like digital infrastructure are a necessary condition, but they're not sufficient. And there are other things that have to be in place as well. So this is from uh, Ghani, O'Connell, and Kerr. Uh, and this, this is, again, a district, district map. We actually have data on uh, uh, manufacturing entry rates into business. And this, this is very interesting because you can see that uh, so this is formal and informal. I think one, ha one can't just say, OK, we're going to focus on the organized sector. I think one also has to understand what's going on in the informal or unorganized sector. You can see that actually in, in um, uh, some of the regions that, look, that you know, show up as relatively poor, you actually have a lot of business entry. But then the question is, you know, what is the size of these businesses? What is the value added? Are they, are they, are they lasting and so on? So again, I think my point is that, you know, Looking at this level uh, gets one on the right track. It doesn't necessarily automatically give you answers. So, and similarly in services, we have we have these patterns. So this is these are obviously too much too too much uh, detail. But what what do they, what did they conclude? What you do in these kind of cases, or uh, economist does, is run run regressions, look for you know average impacts, and we have some very clear lessons: local education levels and physical infrastructure quality promote entry. Strict labor regulations discourage formal sector entry, as, as one might expect. But this was also quite interesting and not so obvious. Better household banking environments encourage entry in the organ unorganized sector. And so uh, you know, people who may not be necessarily equipped to uh, enter the formal sector directly, at least what, what is happening in terms of financial inclusion is giving them at least the first step 
to uh, e economic progress. So I, I, I thought this was really interesting. And then strong agglomeration economies in India's manufacturing sector. I think this is going to be a key for India is how to build these uh, uh, clusters of uh, growth. And obviously, those are going to be around towns and cities. So that, that's, I think, where everything is going to have to focus. And so looking very quickly at cities, this is uh, a graph which compares India and China. And this is number of employees. You can see the contrast between India in terms of the staffing at local levels and the uh, uh, local government personnel for China and India. And it's a little bit exaggerated because when you, talk, when you say local in China, sub-provincial, they are often very large entities. And India kind of has, even the districts are relatively small compared to some of China's subnational structures. So nevertheless, it, it tells us where one of the weaknesses is in India in terms of uh, inadequate decentralization. You can see that in the uh, Reserve Bank of India report on municipal finances, which uh, is, is worth reading for everybody, <laughs> economists or not. And, and uh, the main point, again, is, is that the uh, own revenues of the cities are extremely low relative to the economic activity that they are supporting. And uh, maybe they get state funds, but it doesn't enable autonomous uh, uh, direction of economic growth. And again, China shows a different path forward, I think. So I'm getting uh, close to the end. And just a little bit about innovation systems is going to be a major topic uh, through, the, through the conference. And uh, you know, again, you know, it, it, it's more than just uh, unicorns. And I'll, I'll uh, show you a, couple, uh, a few more maps to finish up. So this is from the Center for Technology, Innovation, and Economic Research. Uh, this is a, a map of, of uh, R&D, industrial, industrial R&D centers. And this tells us where, uh, hopefully, the knowledge is being generated that is going to uh, foster technological innovation. Again, you can see a, somewhat of a, uh, the same pattern. The, the richer states, the industrial states, have more of this activity. It's not always clear that knowledge has to be uh, you know, trapped in a location. It, it, it can be implemented uh, you know, more than locally. It can be implemented globally. But there is, a, I think, a neglected local component which uh, has to be um, uh, paid attention to. And uh, this, this is uh, higher technology and knowledge intensive R&D centers. So again, you can see uh, that there's a, there's a kind of concentration in the states that are already doing well. Now again, the policy implications, I think, are complicated. One very interesting uh, effort of the government, uh, Niti Aayog, is actually the uh, uh, creation of these uh, Atal incubation centers. And they're also trying to revitalize the established incubation centers. And part of the idea is, is to uh, foster entrepreneurship, not just you know, for future unicorns, but much more broadly, and also to have uh, a little more uh, geographic presence. And again, uh, it, it doesn't have to be throughout a state, but every state presumably should have some kind of uh, go-to place for, the, for these kinds of efforts. OK, so that was a, a very quick tour of the garden. And uh, we still have to pull out the weeds and, uh, and put the fertilizer and so on. But uh, now you know where, what we need to do. Thank you. And uh, let's see who's going to go next. Um, um, yeah, I, think, I think Rick, Rick you're, you're next. Great, thanks. A uh, quick introduction. So Rick Rosso, I run the India program at a think tank in Washington called the Center for Strategic International Studies, uh, focused heavily on what's happening with India's economic reforms. but. Uh, a very unique subfocus on what's happening at the uh, state level. And that's driven by my early days working in India 25 years ago for the US India Business Council when uh, just with my Russian studies degree, knowing nothing about India, I was thrust into the deep end. Um, a lot of the payment disputes by US companies that built power projects in India. And we'd show up in Delhi meeting with the national government talking about this. And of course, they would tell us there's very few tools the national government has to negotiate problems at the state level. So uh, we, we really kind of found that the center of power is a little heavier there. So when I when I left the business community and moved to a think tank nine years ago, um, really kind of focusing on states was uh, sort of the mission that I wanted to undertake. So I'll talk a little bit about what's been happening in recent years, which a lot of this has been touched on, of course, by Dr. Broy and others. But uh, between center-state relations, what's happening at states, and uh, echoing a little bit from what Dr. Singh said on municipal governments. Uh, first of all, you know, I think I'm never sure with these kind of programs whether we're talking about India 101 or 102, depending on 
or 201, depending on who's in the audience. So I've got a little bit of mix of uh, mix of both. But you know, to a lot of Americans, uh, the footprint that they think about is Delhi, Mumbai, Bangalore. And if they're really crazy, uh, they know these places like Hyderabad and Chennai exist. Um, the footprint doesn't often go beyond that. Of course, the U.S. government has got counsel; it's beyond that. But uh, the footprint doesn't uh, oftentimes go beyond. And you know, something as uh, Dr. Broy mentioned, you know, you've got the Constitution dividing up powers into three different levels. Uh, this offers a little bit more context in terms of some of the broad areas that are covered underneath the, uh, the three schedules in the Constitution that delineate uh, uh, policymaking. Um, the reality overall in India, too, is that the states collectively have far more uh, authority over what the direction of India's development policy is going to be than the national government. And yet there's relatively little attention paid by the world in terms of what's happening at the state level. Here in the United States, if you're talking to businesses and other development professionals, and they're following when does U.S. state legislatures meet, what bills are they passing, what regulations are they issuing, things like that. That barely exists in India. Um, so state governments oftentimes, a lot of the work that they do is done almost in a vacuum of feedback. Uh, of course, that's been changing. We'll touch on some of the helpful things that have been done in recent years. Um, you know, when, when you look at, uh, and, and uh, some, one of the things that you hear constantly when people are talking about India, what's going right, what's going wrong, what do they like, what do they not like, you hear about Modi as a centralizing figure. I'm sure probably everybody's heard that to some extent. There's some areas where it's true. But in terms of managing center state relations, the opposite is actually very true. The first years when the Modi government took office back in 2014, and the single biggest step, in my opinion, the government's taken, is abolishing the planning commission. The Soviet holdover that was the central government's main body to whip states into shape and telling them what they had to do to meet national targets. Now, people were talking about that a little bit, but I don't remember you know, this huge drive, like the first thing you've got to do when you take office is abolishing the Planning Commission. It did. You know, and some people think Niti Ayog, new wine in an old bottle, but if you know the functions the Planning Commission had versus what Niti does, Niti has a great place that it fits in the, the environment. But the Planning Commission was a totally different beast, much more powerful, very different things. And to voluntarily give that up now is a former state leader that probably hated having you know, Delhi nudging him here and there. I'm, I can understand why that would have been an interest area. Uh, they uh, allowed states to begin negotiating international development loans directly. What kind of a centralizing figure all of a sudden hands the keys to the car for engaging with international institutions to state governments? That is not something that somebody who's trying to centralize power and authority does. Now, states, of course, have to get their finances in order to be able to avail of this window, which is not an easy thing. Uh, third, you know, big jump in terms of uh, you know, following the Finance Commission report, in terms of uh, national revenue that's given back to the state governments as block grants rather than tied. Um, so big steps that the government took out of the gates to actually give state governments more tools. And while sometimes it's also people think, well, you know, he's such a central, a powerful figure within the party, he was just handing the keys over to folks in his own party. But in 2014, when he took office, the BJP had, I think, four or five chief ministers in the country. He was given all this power and authority to folks that were opposing him every single day, not to uh, you know, folks that were within his own party. Again, not something that a, that a centralizing figure would necessarily, uh, necessarily do. But also, and this has been covered, you know, empowering and challenging states to do better. This concept of competitive cooperative federalism. Um, you know, I, for, for somebody who's been, again, doing this work in India for 25 years, you always felt that the center was a little reluctant to push states and nudge them. And they moved into you know, some pretty aggressive areas. On the positive side, drafting model laws. You know, NITI, DPIIT, groups like that have been drafting model laws and regulations because sometimes a state government's bench of uh, you know, technical leads that can draft this stuff may be a little bit light. So in areas like, uh, like agricultural land leasing and uh, the Shops and Establishments Act, the central government will offer draft models for states to consider. Take it or don't. But at least they've got a model that a partner has, has kind of vetted and attempted to, um, you know, to, to show what's possible. Ranking states across multiple domains. Every single week, it feels like, and Amit does a lot of this work as well, but you see rankings of states and how they're doing on healthcare and entrepreneurship. And of course, the one that touches a business guy near and dear to my heart is the Business Form Action Plan, which tries to go one step deeper than what the World Bank does in measuring the business environment. And they've got hundreds of factors they look at in state governments to see how they kind of stack up. Now, it's self-reporting by states, so, you know, there's always a little bit of question about is it the most honest assessment that can be done, but you're going from zero. You're going from zero to having a, it comes out about every two years, it's a little irregular, but, um, you know, where you can actually see which states have the better and worst business environments. And then the national missions, as we talked about before, the ability to deploy and at scale, you know, the last 18,000 villages that didn't have electricity. 
Got that done early on coming in. And then electricity to every home. The Jaljeevan water mission. You know, these things are immense. Oh, wrong way. Now, for somebody who engages state governments almost exclusively when I'm in India, uh, there's a lot of challenges, not, not surprisingly. Capacity constraints I mentioned before. Um, there is a concern about uh, lack of, uh, of transparency. Um, you know, a lot of times as we try to track state, and some of you may know, we have a weekly update on state regulations. Um, and a lot of that we have to go by uh, what you see in press references because state governments still don't publish regulations after they're approved sometimes for, for some time thereafter. Um, if you track the gazettes, but not every gazette uh, notification comes out in a timely way. Um, you know, you talk about India trying to grab a, chair, uh, a share of global supply chains and what's happening with manufacturing shifts. Um, state governments have been trying to climb on something that uh, Modi had been doing as Chief Minister of Gujarat, having these investment summits. Uh, various levels of professionalism, how those are organized. Um, sometimes, you know, a week before, they'll come out to the United States on a roadshow and try to get some CEOs to go out and do it. And, you know, you need to work on it a little bit better, but some states are quite good at it. Uh, state re-election rates, you hear about this a lot of, um, uh, you know, concerns about uh, anti-incumbency factor. But uh, good news on that front. It's actually changed quite a bit in the last 10 years. Uh, 25, 30 years ago, the average re-election rate of a state government was about one in four. And you think about policy consistency across long periods of time, the things you need to build infrastructure, one in four, you can't make big bets. State governments come in, and their job is to blow money out the door in four or five years to try to win re-election, and still failing. Um, today, re-election rates are a little over 50%. And some of the states that have the worst development factors, Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, Odisha, uh, actually have the highest um, uh, political stability. Uh, Madhya Pradesh, you know, Congress was in there briefly, but otherwise those states have had re relatively high political stability. When state governments change, there is often huge change in policy thrusts and re revocation of contracts the previous government, non-honoring of investor incentives previous governments have done. It doesn't happen every time, but it happens often. And it happens in states that people are excited about. It happens in Tamil Nadu. It happened in Andhra a couple of years ago. It happened in Maharashtra. So, um, so that makes it a little bit difficult, too, for businesses to you know, kind of plan. Short tenure for bureaucrats at the state level. And, uh, and lastly, and of course, one of my favorite topics, which you already touched on, is um, you know, still not enough devolution of power to cities. Um, and, and we'll hit on that a little bit, uh, a little bit too. Um, sorry, yep, okay. Uh, there's a handful of functions, um, I, I won't, but if you haven't read the report, read it. In my opinion, as somebody who reads all the technical studies everybody puts out about India every single day, I don't read newspapers, I don't read books, I love technical studies. And this, this RBI report on the state of municipal finances if you want your mind blown in terms of what the next evolution of development should look like, it may not, but what it should look like, uh, this report that is now supposed to be an annual on the state of municipal finances in India, which states have done bonds, things like that, uh, it, was, uh, it was fantastic. It is a real different contribution, I think, to our understanding of how the country functions and the pathway for India's uh, further economic development, which has got to be based at least partially on, on stronger uh, investments in, uh, in infrastructure. Um, I'll wrap up with, uh, with one final slide on that, you know, and I know as Dr. Debro hinted, you know, the, the actual numbers that, that blue, uh, that blue uh, oval may move to the left a little bit because India is urbanizing a bit faster than the official numbers sometimes portray. But state governments today, which have almost all the power and authority for everything that needs to happen on the development path, are driven by rural voter interests. And until that changes, until using the cities as the kiddies to soak, to fund subsidies in the countryside on electricity and water and things like that. Until that changes, until state governments feel they're gonna win election by building cities and building the infrastructure that businesses need, then you know, India will do well at six, 7% growth on good years. But boy, when that inflection point hits, when encouraging cities, industrial uh, inputs and that become the drivers for elections rather than an afterthought. So we think we have it pretty good today. Um, some point in the next decade, or the next generation, um, things are gonna change dramatically. And they will in some states even faster. But uh, there is gonna be an inflection point when, uh, when voters, urban voters begin winning elections. And that's when I think uh, state governments are gonna start taking longer term decisions, investments in infrastructure, building the cities that as was talked about before, uh, will become the engines of India's growth and prosperity. I'll wrap it up with that, thanks. Thank you so much, Rick. All right, so uh, I'll, I am the city's man. I actually lead the Smart Cities Mission Program, and uh, uh, I've, uh, you know, I fully uh, uh, sort of uh, understand uh, the issue of uh, 
local autonomy to cities in the country because I've been city manager in three of this, uh, three of important cities of the state of Maharashtra. And uh, I'll, I'll start with what uh, two, two or three of you have really highlighted in the morning uh, about India being at an interesting position as far as, as its urban evolution is concerned. Uh, uh, Professor Bibek Debro actually talked about, uh, uh, Dr. Bibek Debro actually talked about uh, us being uh, at around 45% urban. But if you look at World Bank's agglomeration index of 2009, I think it's, uh, if you go by that, uh, we are already about 60% urban. If you go by the Mexican definition, we are already about 70% urban. So uh, there's a lot of urbanization already to deal with. And in the future, of course, uh, probably we are at the cusp of even more rapid urbanization. Uh, and what does this entail? Uh, of course, a lot of opportunity, but a huge amount of challenge as far as creation of infrastructure is concerned. Uh, basic services to high quality infrastructure and services, everything. And uh, so we're part of uh, a lot of deliberation within the union government of what our path should be and what it entails for us uh, as uh, financial and uh, other resources for us to really achieve our targets by 2047, what Christian just presented. And uh, the figures are mind boggling. In fact, the amount of investment that all of us have so far calculated its work in progress is about $6 trillion to go into uh, fixing infrastructure and services in urban areas. Uh, and that is a phenomenal amount of money when we consider that every year what's actually getting invested today is $20 billion or so. So if you just multiply it by 25 years, that comes to $500 billion, and we're talking of 10 times that figure uh, till 2047. So uh, one, obviously, we need to change paradigms the usual sort of working between the federal system that we have and uh, the low autonomy that we have for cities and regions clearly needs to change. And uh, a lot of freedom needs to be given to raise finances. But also, there's also a need for targeted investments and targeting investments in areas where we will get maximum bang for the buck. And that is where I think the regional story is very important to understand something that has not been really studied much. Uh, in fact, I haven't honestly been able to look at that very seriously until I uh, um, landed at the, at the central ministry and gradually understood that what we are trying to do is an impossible hill to climb. We need to target investments in some ways. Uh, and therefore, regional insights are very important. So I'll take on this presentation from there. And uh, I'll quickly present before you some uh, research that has been done by some people we collaborate with, and I'll quickly present that so that it just gives you a flavor of what is happening at the regional level. And then I'll probably uh, you know, mix this with what we are trying to do in smart cities and cities, and then see what implications are there as far as action points are there for our country and both at the central uh, state and as well as the local levels. Uh, right, sorry. Uh, so I'll draw on this, uh, uh, these two documents. One is a work in progress, the city economic product document that we are in the process of creating. Mm. And there's a recent uh, research which was published by two researchers. Uh, this is the book called Regional Economic Diversity. I picked up from this research. We collaborate with these researchers. I thought this is, a, uh, this is very contextual to the kind of discussion we are having, so I'm uh, taking that as a starting point. Now, within, they have actually looked at regions and uh, there are three different approaches to how we can look at regions. One is this homogeneity criteria where uh, places with contiguous uh, districts, uh, physical, economic, social, and other characteristics being same. So that is one. The second is nodality or polarization, let's say a CBD or let's say a specific uh, special economic zone kind of thing that could be looked at as a region. And third is a policy region, which is like a district as a as an administrative unit or so. So this, uh, so this book, which I have uh, henceforth mentioned as read, uh, Regional Economic Diversity, has applied the homogeneity criteria. And incidentally, this is a criteria which has been used by the National Sample Survey. And uh, they have uh, delineated regions across the country. There are currently about 88 regions as part of the National Sample Survey. Uh, and this has grown over time. Uh, so. Uh, so what this research has done is uh, they've tried uh, to manufacture a, a way of calculating regional value added. Uh, if you look at the, the, the formula on top, 
basically it's the state domestic product into regional employment divided by state employment into regional wage by stage wage, state wage. But you don't have, uh, uh, the wage is a very difficult uh, uh, parameter to calculate because the National Sur Sample Survey doesn't actually capture self-employment data. So, and that being a large component of India's employment, uh, apart from casual labor and people who are employed in regular salaried employment and are in formal employment, uh, there was a trick done by these researchers in actually uh, using a proxy for the workers' participation rate. Uh, and so instead of using the wage, they have used regional WPR by state WPR to give it the index of productivity uh, to be able to calculate the regional uh, GVA. And uh, well, I am not a researcher, I am a practitioner. I'm using this uh, to just open up that there is a great need for further research in this area and uh, you know, finalization of how to actually do these calculations. Then they have used something called the diversification index where they've used uh, uh, you know, the National Industrial Classification, an IC document, and they have used uh, the two-digit classification criteria, which is literally 14 segments, health, construction, agriculture, manufacturing, and so on. And uh, diversity, so this factor that they have created uh, is zero when it's close to minimum diversity and one maximum diversity. And they've used the urbanization percentage with uh, that's a fairly simple one, number of people living in urban areas to total population. So using this, uh, there are certain insights that have been created. Uh, and uh, if, you go to the, if you go to what they've come out with, this is fairly interesting for a person like me when I'm thinking of the huge investments and the huge uh, challenges that lie ahead in dealing with these problems and also looking at why, how you know, different regions are performing. So if you look at the last column, uh, even though the state ranks have rather not moved, and this is data between 2005 and 2012, uh, one another problem with Indian surveys is that it happens sometimes, it doesn't happen, and therefore you have very little data over a long period of time. So I'm using data from 2004 and 2011 because I had good uh, you know, analysis possible from that data. So if you look at the last column, state ranks haven't moved within the states. Uh, you know, regions have moved, for example, uh, the second row, if you see this region, southeastern region in Gujarat, has moved from nowhere, literally, to number two in the ranking. Uh, you know, the coastal region in Maharashtra has moved from 10 to three, while Maharashtra has remained at one throughout. So the point that is coming out is, even though the larger state remains where it is, within the states themselves, different regions are moving up and down quite violently, and that needs to be understood. Uh, and I'll just focus on the state I come from. Uh, there are six NSS regions in this state. And you can see uh, the kind of movement uh, uh, that is happening within the regions. Some of them are, re are really moving up very fast while the state uh, uh, continues to remain where it is on an aggregate basis as far as the rankings are concerned. So you see a lot of regional diversity within states. And we actually do not have uh, tailor-made policies, tailor-made investments, tailor-made actions uh, for regions at the moment. And probably this research, that have, it, it, it draws uh, the point that we need to look at them quite uh, uh, seriously. So a couple of things that come out from this. One, that uh, uh, the usual suspect, uh, but not really the way I would have thought it would come out, that uh, the, the, the regions with the highest uh, uh, value added, the RVA, uh, you see most of these regions have high urbanization percentages. Uh, but it's all over the place. It's, it's high, but it's, it's very varied. The other thing you see is that uh, regions with higher diversity of employment sectors have performed better, hmm. which also is uh, the point that you made about clusters, also this point about economic complexity uh, that shows up uh, uh, with, with the limited data that is there. Uh, However, if you look at this, this map of urban shares, uh, one of the things that comes out is uh, uh, with, the, with the size of cities, there is uh, hardly any correlation. So some of these regions which are performing well as far as the value added is concerned have urban populations, but they are split into many small cities as well. And uh, so this probably, uh, if you look at some of these regions which are not performing very well, and also have big cities, there may be congestion effects that this is pointing out too. And also this clearly brings out the fact that we as a country need to focus more on small cities and small towns as well. Uh, and probably there uh, we can get quicker growth 
uh, going forward. Uh, so four core questions were attempted in this research. Are there any patterns of development more dynamic at the regional level compared to the state level? Clearly, yes. And we can see them across the NSS regions across the country. What is the extent of sectoral diversity at regional levels? What is this diversity a function of? Well, it depends. Data is not very sound here. Uh, and uh, not, much can be not much ground can be covered in this research. But skills is a possible suspect. And places with higher capabilities are doing better and with higher diversity are doing better, but <coughs> needs more work. How can we measure differences in output at the regional level? Uh, method used here is a mix of RBI's method, a method which was uh, uh, propounded in one of the uh, researchers published in 2011 and UN Habitat Guidelines. But I would love, as a practitioner, to have more research done in this area because, uh, because of the challenges of targeted investments and looking at you know, social and economic progress much deeper and granularly. And of course, are output levels influenced by the level of sectoral diversity, urbanization, et cetera? Yes, data is a major issue, but I think it's, uh, the initial hints are clearly there. Uh, so there are a lot of takeaways for businesses, diversification for businesses, focus on skilling and improving quality of uh, workforce. Uh, choice of locations for fresh investments is very important. For government, of course, uh, small cities and towns have to become a clear focus area. Uh, there seems to be taking this, uh, there seems to be uh, uh, credibility in taking this work on uh, the regional framework to define policies, et cetera, forward. And a big effort needed to improve data systems in the country to be able to really uh, visualize these effects. Uh, of course, uh, 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 as I said, uh, for a practitioner like me, for someone who's uh, you know, leading a very important program of the government, it always becomes very important to look at getting maximum bang from the buck. If I could use uh, economic data to do infrastructure development, to better finance, to look at you know, policy action, which is much more tailored and specific, to be able to create community action, to be able to engage civil society into the discussion, to be able to create more data for research, uh, we will be doing much better than what we are doing currently. And, uh, and there are many examples of cities and regions which have done that. Cape Town 2040 is a document which is very, uh, very uh, you know, in sync with the kind of uh, discussion we are having. Scottish city municipal bonds using various kinds of data around finance and in, uh, investment to be able to define your course as a municipality. And Think Perth is a document which is about engaging city and the civil society in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, this, uh, in this work. Uh, so I'll, you know, if you are current level of complexity is low in a in a in a particular uh, region, uh, you could, you know, uh, so this is this is just a matrix of the kind of work that may be required uh, to improve uh, uh, the RVA in particular regions. Uh, so you know, it could either be bridge over troubled waters because you either very low on current complexity and your ease to jump to new areas of work is difficult or uh, to it basically being uh, you know, uh, just providing for ample space, not tinkering too much, creating a benevolent environment if you are high on both the, both the numbers. And uh, we have a lot of challenge with economic monitoring of cities and regions for now, primarily. Yeah, I'm just finishing, okay. So I should, this is under consideration. Uh, I'll skip this. Uh, this is an approach that we had taken. This is some estimate that we have created with our uh, current ways of uh, calculating city GDP. Does AI, technology, chat GPT, et cetera, et cetera, have a solution? We came across an interesting idea. That there's a company called Premise uh, based out of Washington, which does GDP calculation in Nigeria by taking a lot of photographs by, through volunteers, uh, uh, outside grocery shops, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know if some, something can really work to give us some directional idea. Uh, I will move ahead from this. this this is currently the structure of urban programs in, the, in, in India. Uh, I lead the 100 Smart Cities program. A lot of investments going in, but not enough, as we clearly see. And finally, all this probably is leading to these seven, eight conclusions. And this is my last slide. I'll just read through them. One, of course, this need to deepen economic data generation and analysis at regional and local levels is very important. Second, the policy environment is not uh, really harmonious, uh, and silos uh, uh, really don't help to get harmonious focus on economic growth. Uh, we have to f very clearly understand specific local cause-effect relationships between economic growth and urbanization and diversity. Uh, our investments have to be focused through the lens of improvement of economic complexity, 
better competitiveness to get maximum bang for the buck. We have to transform local governments into economic development enterprises. I call this a triple engine government. Decentralization is how we describe it. Uh, triple engine in the sense of the city, state, and center working together uh, in a collaborative manner, just like Christian just mentioned. That collaborative effort has to go up. Uh, increased focus on smaller towns and cities is required. We need to prioritize understanding of trade-offs between balanced regional development and economic imperatives. Sometimes the social and economic both have to be married together. It's not an easy task to do in a country like ours. Uh, and possibly an integrated mechanism, both at the national level, the state level, and the city level, to look at economic growth uh, in a harmonious way. So I'll stop here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sean, over to you. So thanks very much, Nirvikari. I don't have any slides. I'm just going to talk for a couple of minutes here. Um, so I run a business-supported think tank based in San Francisco that focuses on the economy of the Bay Area and Silicon Valley in particular, uh, also California. And we constantly look at how the Bay Area and Silicon Valley relate to, connect to critical overseas partners through flows of trade, but also investment and flows of human capital. So India is, is very, very much on our screen. So I'm going to try to give a perspective uh, from Silicon Valley. When you're from the outside looking in at India, uh, what does that landscape look like in terms of Indian states? Because of course, when you're an investor here or, or anywhere, and you, you, know, you can look at India as a country and see the incentives. Uh, UPI, the different national missions, um, investment incentives at the national level, you know, the, the rapid and highly effective pace of digitalization. Uh, we've seen, led by some really innovative government policies in the last you know, eight or 10 years, six or eight years, uh, that gives this really impressive national context. But in the end, if you're an investor, you're going to be in a state. And you're going to be in a city, just like if you're coming in the US, you can invest in California, it's really different from Arizona, it's really different from Illinois or in Nebraska. So where you go as an investor matters depending on what you actually are trying to achieve. So um, I, I want to thank Ahmed and the folks who worked on the latest India Innovation Index. It's a great tool. Uh, I, I use it a lot. And so if we look at, <clears throat> at the index, what, what are the top five states around innovation? So, Karnataka, Telangana, Haryana, Maharashtra, and Tamil Nadu. And then among the city states, sort of Chandigarh and Delhi come out on top. So, you know, it's based on a really interesting mix of indicators of secondary schools with ICT labs, for example, PhD enrollment, applications for patents and trademarks and for industrial designs, uh, growth in the startup sector and state policies around the business environment and innovation. So I think if you look at all the Me Mexico, I work in Mexico too, all the Indian states, uh, I think everybody, is, many are trying to do sort of expedited investment promotion and enabling. So UP just came out with its framework, it's at the single window, you're an investor, you can have access to all these different, different agencies to expedite things. So I think you can do that, and that's a necessary step, but eventually you're gonna have to look at those, those, those policies and, and characteristics that define the technology environment and the innovation environment for companies coming from Silicon Valley and companies that are headquartered within 25 to 30 miles here account for an enormous share of the foreign investment going from the United States into India today. So what, what, what they think certainly matters. Uh, there are other measures of variability that come out of the index that are pretty interesting. Uh, for like fixed capital formation, Gujarat accounts for about 25% of the total, followed by Maharashtra and Tamil Nadu. Um, exports, Maharashtra and Gujarat, 50% between them. Patenting, Maharashtra is about 50%. So again, the concentration in these different states uh, really is manifested in a lot of important ways. So thinking about the investors from the Bay Area and Silicon Valley that are in India today, there's a lots and lots, you know, they're, they're, they're all over the map, but just to identify a few of the key ones and where, where they're located, where they've chosen to be, uh, we've got Cisco uh, in Gurgaon, Mumbai, Chennai, Pune, Kolkata, Hyderabad, and their second global campus in, in, in Bangalore. Uh, we've got Google 
in uh, Hyderabad, Bangalore, Mumbai, and Gurgaon. We've got Meta in Hyderabad, Delhi, uh, Gurgaon, Mumbai, and Bangalore. Twitter's in Bangalore. Uh, Salesforce, Bangalore, big R&D center, Mumbai, Delhi, Pune, and Hyderabad. They have 7,500 7, employees. It's their second largest employment center outside the United States. Uh, WhatsApp, Gurgaon, uh, and Hyderabad. Uh, LinkedIn, Delhi, Mumbai, Bangalore, uh, uh, number two global market after the United States for LinkedIn, then Apple uh, in, in, in Chennai since 2017. Uh, so you can see where they are. They're, they are in those states that, that we're talking about as being leading states in the, in the innovation index. Uh, if we look at the FDI that is going into India just in, in dollar terms from, from this part of the world, uh, in 2022, uh, there was $1.36 billion of investment by Bay companies going into India, across 63 deals. By far, ICT and electronics uh, were the biggest, uh, the lion's share for that, about $875 billion, uh, more than two-thirds of all the investment going into India from this part of the world are in ICT and, and electronics. And again, where, where did it go? To what states? Uh, Karnataka, like huge winner, number one, uh, 391 million. Maharashtra, 345 million, uh, with about half of that in Mumbai. Telangana, Hyderabad, of course, 261 million. Tamil Nadu, 103, 133 million, of which most went to Chennai. Uh, Haryana, 37 million, uh, going to Gurgaon. So again, we're, we're seeing those states, and the level of FDI going into uh, India from the Bay Area, uh, of course, it dropped in 2020 with a little bit with the, uh, with the pandemic. And then guess what, 2021, 22, it popped right back up to pre-pandemic levels. So that's both new investment going in, and that's also reinvestment or expansion of existing capacity and, and, and facility. Uh, also looking at, at venture investment. Uh, a lot of venture firms from here earlier in the 2000s, they, they really weren't finding uh, a lot of exits, a lot of profitability, so a bunch exited. But then uh, with the Flipkart deal a few years ago, uh, they started to come in often operating through their, their, their India arms. And so we've seen venture investment flowing from this region, from Sand Hill Road, and right outside the door, and San Francisco uh, into India. Uh, Biggest investor uh, last year, I guess, Sequoia Capital. Uh, 125 deals by Sequoia in India. Uh, other big ones from here, Axel Partners, like 79 deals. Y Combinator, 59 deals. Matrix, 12 deals. Lightspeed, Nexus, and, and others. So that kind of investment, as distinguished from FDI, is going into India. But it's going into those same cities, and it's going into those same states. So what, what, are, what are the competitive criteria? Um, they kind of go back to the things in the innovation index. Uh, number one is always going to be talent. Uh, and then you have the educational systems underlying the generation of talent behind that. But the ability to generate uh, large numbers of employable engineers. They may have the skills right away. They may need retraining. But access to a lot of engineers. Uh, behind that, a lot of uh, training and education in digital skills and engineering skills where science comes into play, but business too, of course, uh, where the IITs, uh, Bangalore, Indian Institute of Science, big asset, uh, innovation ecosystems, uh, those are really critical for the, uh, the venture investors. And the state policies to enable the growth of those systems is, is, are, are very, very important. And then there's infrastructure. So infrastructure certainly comes in for companies where, well, you got to get around. I think we've all tried to move around Bangalore and found it a bit of an issue. Uh, but that's when companies start to go to Hyderabad, because they planned out their, their infrastructure. So that's important. But that also especially comes into play when we talk about investment in, 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 in manufacturing. So um, and to think about the future, looking at it from companies here, the, the digitalization of the economy is, is a massive opportunity. I think we're seeing just the enablement of financial services, remote health services. You know, you can name your, your sector being you know, an enormous draw. 
Silicon Valley isn't good at everything, but if anything it's doing, it, it's driving the digitaliz digitalization of the world economy. And then if we see that happening in parallel, the growth of the digital economy in, in India, that's important. So the national policies play a really, really important role there. Um, there's a larger geostrategic focus now, of course, with the Quad, what's happening with, with China. I think that's driving more bilateral alignment in, in R&D and maybe other things around fields like cybersecurity, um, AI, potentially semiconductors. Um, but if you look at the massive investment from here now, it's in those states, those same five states that we, we've been talking about. Um, it's drawn by that kind of uh, sort of human infrastructure around, around the skills and the talent, which is so important. And lastly, the one thing we haven't talked about is manufacturing. So not much of this is manufacturing. Uh, obviously, India would like to get more manufacturing happening in India. Uh, it's not known globally as a great manufacturing place. You know, it, it, it could be perhaps, but I think in this case, we may want to look at what's happening with, with Apple. It's the only big player here that really does manufacture in, in India. Um, I know the government would like to get uh, Intel and other uh, chip firms in there, but right now I think they're, they're, not, they're not ready to do that yet. One day maybe they will be, but, but uh, I think Apple went into India manufacturing in 2017 through a Taiwanese contract uh, producer, Riston, and they were producing older iPhones. And then around 2020, they went in through Foxconn in Chennai and started to produce, for the first time, their latest model iPhone. And, and that, that was the 11. And that was a big step to actually produce the latest model iPhone in India. Um, now they've, they, they, they've, they're producing the 14 in India, in Chennai. And just a couple of months ago, they said they were going to up their production of that. So I think what we're seeing there is a, uh, a growing investment in India by Apple, having built on the capacity they've already developed through Foxconn, uh, but sort of a vote of confidence as they don't leave China. They're still enormously dependent on production in China, but they very deliberately are shifting their global supply chains to reduce uh, dependence on China and kind of expand capacity in other markets. So I, I think that's the one question I, I, I would leave you with that uh, we may want to look at what's happened with, with uh, Apple in, in Chennai and see what made that work, what are the lessons from that, because as global supply chains do continue to realign uh, for security reasons, for just reliability and resilience reasons, as some activity uh, leaves China, it's going to go to one of two or three places, it's going to go to Southeast Asia, it's going to go to Mexico, or it's going to go to India. And so there's a big opportunity now for, for India around manufacturing, uh, if it can get the right conditions uh, in, in uh, Indian states. Thanks. Thank you, Sean. So uh, we have time for uh, two or three questions. And if uh, we could have somebody um, take the mic around, and please keep your questions uh, brief and specific. Uh, is, is, yeah, please. And if, if you could just introduce yourself. Yeah. Hi, I'm, I'm Richard Demania from the World Bank, uh, uh, an economist there, one of thousands. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess my question is more to Sean, but you know, the other speakers might want to pick up on it. Almost all our discussion since yesterday has been on the high tech sector. And yet we know, and you look at poverty reduction in most countries, the route that we've seen that's been followed has been much more basic manufacture. Indeed, you could just look across the border to Bangladesh, and we know what's happened to the Bangladesh per capita income relative to that of India. And a lot of that is put down to fairly basic textiles. So what are you seeing as being the barriers to that kind of manufacture, which is so important for basic development and poverty reduction? Because we know not everyone can work in Apple, not everyone is going to be able to work in Cisco and so on. So, uh, Rick, do you want to take that one? <laughs> Go for it. I'll or, just add in. Uh, well, I think when they announced the Make in India initiative, I mean, the initial thrust, when they were traveling the world trying to encourage, it was like semiconductors, IT. And when you think about the drivers for the manufacturing, you know, it's job creation, but it's also, you know, to a huge extent, 
it's uh, trying to help offset um, you know, the areas where India is importing pretty heavily. India has a massive trade deficit. I mean, uh, this year it's going to be about 10 percent of GDP. I mean, here in the United States, we're grappling with trade, and ours is only about a third of that. Um, and so, you know, that second factor, I mean, a lot of what India is importing, apart from oil, you know, is finished goods, particularly technology goods from China and other places. So I kind of, under, kind of understand why that would have been a thrust area. But, you know, it wouldn't really help you right as much on the uh, job creation front. Um, aspirations, I mean, you know, they're very excited about uh, moving to the front of the list. We see this, I thought the point you brought up on climate was, was, was stellar. Uh, we're running a private conversation series with the largest global climate foundations and chief ministers. And the one thing you learn about that, you know, is uh, uh, voters in India don't care about climate change at all, but they love the jobs. And so if they can use this as an impetus to move to the top of the list on climate-related jobs, e-mobility and things like that, you know, so aspirations part of it, uh, trade offsets, you know, is part of it, but it is kind of missing the jobs. And I'd say in the last couple of years, you've seen a real twist in making India where they, there is a new thrust, including at the state level, I'm looking at basic manufacturing. So I didn't see it as much out of the gates, but I have seen in the last three or four years a twist in the direction I think that you're talking about. Hopefully they can do both. And I, I'd just add that- Yeah, I, please. I, yeah. So, a, a lot uh, of our- Sean oh, sorry, and yeah. then Kunal. No, go ahead. Uh, um, I think from this part of the world, a lot of our focus is on, on, on the tech manufacturing. Um, the, if you look at the, the manufacturing benefits uh, in China, uh, just through Apple, uh, massive levels of employment. So there, there's, there's a long way to run with, with that kind of manufacturing in, in India. So I, I think Apple kind of breaks the mold and maybe that model spreads. But I think thinking about manufacturing more generally, one reason from an outside standpoint it hasn't moved faster is, you know, if you're in manufacturing as opposed to IT, uh, <clears throat> you're moving stuff around. You know, you've got supply chains in and out. And if you're a global manufacturer and you're going to drop anchor, you've got to be sure you can get your product from A to B to C to D in and out. And these parts move back and forth across borders multiple times. And uh, until not long ago, that infrastructure wasn't there in India. Uh, it was there in China. So I, I think one key part of the infrastructure beyond, beyond the human infrastructure we didn't talk about was just you know, basic logistical infrastructure and the importance of having that in place for attracting uh, large-scale uh, international manufacturing, Thank you. Or, or domestic. I think, could I so, ask yeah, some of the things and then that, we'll take one more question. Yeah, some of the things I can reflect on as a practitioner is uh, there, was a, there were a lot of hurdles in actually you know, uh, making industry work. Uh, we had an archaic set of labor laws. Uh, there was uh, hardly any ease of doing business uh, approach. Uh, and then, of course, over-regulation Things like GST, Sir talked about formalization. Uh, that's been a very difficult process. And, uh, and, and I think all of those have been critical efforts by the government over the last few years. Labor laws uh, have been reduced from, I think, some 40 odd to four. Uh, there's a lot of work on decriminalization and uh, over-regulation being brought down. Uh, GST, of course, has been a good reform. There's a lot of reform on land, a lot of reform on economic, uh, uh, sorry, environmental, and other uh, regulation that uh, uh, you know prevents industry from coming up. And of course, as a as a central government, you also can ignite action by comparisons and uh, bringing out data, which is all this innovation index, competitiveness index, the cluster and competitiveness index that has come out. So uh, a lot of action has started to happen on uh, even basic. I think there is a geopolitical need to focus on certain sectors which are very critical to the economy like semiconductor, but also a lot of work is happening on basic industry by enabling sort of through these mechanisms to, you know, industry to come up in a larger way. Can I do one thing, Nirvikar? Yeah, please. Some uh, conductors, yeah. you reminded me. Uh, so it's a big deal to get a fab. You know, they're immensely expensive and they, um, they take enormous amounts of water, which is an issue in here in California. It's an issue, in the, obviously, in India, too. But I think there is an opportunity not think about like the CHIPS Act, the Quad, coordination on global manufacturing of semiconductors. Uh, there's an enormous amount of activity in supply chains mm. and packaging. And I think there's a big opportunity with a lot of employment involved also for India to, to play into the global supply chain for manufacturing of, of of, of components and the supply chain for the semiconductor secretary, uh, sector uh, globally. Great. Thank you. So one, one more question, if, if, 
uh, yes, over there. Uh, quick, quick, please. We are we are all out of time. Yes. All we are talking about uh, reducing. My first, I will introduce myself. I am Mangat Gupta. I am person of intellectual property and uh, understand law. The main problem with the, the common people is that they don't understand law and they cannot uh, hire good persons who are honest in their profession and can implement uh, according, uh, they, they can work according to their needs. And uh, just like labor laws. Sorry, we have to have a question, please. So my question is that the question is that uh, there is a need of some organization which must help these people uh, that is free of uh, any charges so that uh, they can get there. Okay. This is everywhere, not uh, in India. Everywhere this is the requirement. Okay. Can, I, can I answer that question? So um, I was in India last year, and uh, a senior government official basically said that uh, judicial reform is very much on the government's agenda. And I, I think uh, uh, th th this, this, you, you're very right to identify this as an important component, uh, you know, along with specific law reforms and so on that one also needs to have uh, a judicial reform which speeds things up and provides more access. So I, I hope that uh, answers your question. My impression, Vivek, uh, you can correct me, is that this is on the government's agenda. Well, digitization. I mean, there's been some great time value studies that have been done of how courts function. And the time that papers get stuck in physical transit, things like that. And that's some great work that's being done in courts right now in digitizing as well. You can get case resolved a lot sooner if it's not, you know, moving paper, things like that. So, you know, cool resources being deployed in that area as well. Yeah. Excellent. So I'm sorry we've run out of time. Uh, this has been a fantastic panel. I'd like to thank all of you. And, of course, there's going to be a lot of time to follow up uh, individually. And uh, I think what is remarkable for me is how much consistency there is in, in the, um, you know, what, what people are saying about uh, what India needs to do and how to do it. And I think it, there's a lot of clarity, I think, that is emerging for uh, Indian policy making. So thank you all. Uh, Amit, over to you. Thank, thank you so much. For this wonderful uh, interaction, Nirvata.